Hey, Kara Oosterhaus here with realagriculture.com. I am here today at the Farming Supporter Field Day in Lethbridge, Alberta, and I have here with me Dr. David Targelson with the USDA. How's it going today? It's going great. It's so, going great. so you're down here from, or up here, I guess, from Idaho. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell me a bit about your position down there? Well, I'm a, a research agronomist with the Agriculture Research Service, which is USDA's agricultural research uh, branch. And we do research anywhere from like um, crop production, animal production, all the way to food quality as well. And so I'm here uh, speaking about uh, nutrient management under irrigation. So I'm from south, southern Idaho, which is basically fully irrigated. So all of our research there is done under irrigation. And I also spend a lot of my time uh, working on nutrient cycling within cropping systems, as well as in irrigation management as well. So today you were here talking mostly about manure legacy and how that kind of works, especially under irrigation. Do you want to talk about some of your research there? Yeah, so um, in the past, maybe 20 years ago, when I worked for the University of Nebraska, um, and, and with a lot of the current recommendations for uh, nitrogen availability under manured situations, they tend to give a timetable, say about three to four years of nitrogen being released from that manure that can be utilized by crops. Um, but we found in Idaho, at least in our soils, that this, these manure applications can have, can have a much longer effect in terms of nitrogen release, as well as other factors we don't understand yet on crop production, all the way up to say 13 years after manure application. So that application of manure can have a longer term effect on positive effect on crop production than we used to think it did. And how does water play, water availability play into this? Well, water as we know is the main limiting factor in dry land production systems. So it's the number one thing that will, that will control the system in terms of yield and production. And so when you're limited in water, that tends to be the thing that reduces yields, et cetera, right? It, it's not necessarily gonna be nutrients. But when you're, when you're irrigating, you're able to meet the full crop demand. And so water is no longer limiting Therefore, you kind of stabilize the production um, of that system. And so you, you, don't have, you don't have to worry about weather as much because you, you have the water available through irrigation. And so that, that, then you have to start focusing on your other nutrients that can be limiting production. So what, what are some of the other things you found? Um, like you said, there were some unknowns when it comes to mm -hmm. manure. What, what are some of those unknowns you're looking at or considering? Well, with, well, a lot of it has to do with the microbiome. So the microbiome is a term that is supposed to encompass all the uh, microorganisms in the soil. It can be bacteria, fungi, um, et cetera. And so that, that, that whole community of, of uh, micro, microbes in the soil and what they're doing. It's a very complex system and we just don't understand it well. Like if you, if you take a little bit of soil and you go to the lab and culture it, there's a small fraction of those bacteria perhaps or fungi that you can actually grow in the lab. The rest of them you can't. It's a very complex environment that we don't understand very well. So our research is trying to better understand what is that microbiome doing to, that influences crop production, that influences carbon sequestration, et cetera. And so, um, that's what we're trying to do. So it's, it's more than just the nutrients you're adding in the manure. It's the effect of that manure on the native microbiome and how it's changing. And that, and that microbiome's effect on crop production that we're trying to better understand. And to tell you the truth, I kind of equate it to our universe, right? We're here on Earth and we're trying to understand our universe. It's very complex. Everything's very far away. And I would say the soil microbiome is on that same level of of, of lack of understanding as our universe, to tell you the truth. Now, I, I don't want to paint everyone with one brush, of course, but do you, do you think we are, for the most part, uh, applying manure too often? In some situations, you probably can. So I'm sure it's the same here with your cattle industry, right? So, the, so the, it's the ground that's around, adjacent to the cattle uh, feeding lots, et cetera. So down in Idaho, we're dealing with, with uh, cons uh, very concentrated dairy production. And so most of the manure is applied on area around there. And so you tend to start having problems with too much phosphorus and that being an environmental water quality issue with runoff, et cetera. So um, that can be a concern when you're putting too much on those areas. But if you look at the whole land base around that, most of that ground is not getting manure. And we know from our research that applying a moderate amount of manure um, can have a very positive effect. 
and maybe even managed correctly is not gonna have much of a negative effect at all. And so it's all about putting the manure where it needs to go, not where it's most um, convenient to apply it. So with that comes soil testing, of course. Yes. Um, when, when have you found most optimal for soil testing when we're trying to figure out manure applications? Well, I would say this, is if you're talking about testing, um, there's, two, there's, there's two main ones you're going to think about, right? You're thinking about nitrogen applications, right? Trying to, trying to somehow understand how much nitrogen you're going to be putting off of that crop and how much that crop needs. But for a, a, both an agronomic and environmental um, standpoint, it's the phosphorus, right? So um, phosphorus is not necessarily toxic per se to most crops. So if you have high phosphorus, you're not necessarily going to have, uh, for, for, the most, for most cases, a negative effect. Um, because that phosphorus will be made available to the crop, but it's more of an environmental issue. So you look at both the agronomic and environmental um, levels um, with nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. Okay, sounds good. And, and what's the longest you've kind of, you talked about 13 years, is that the longest you've looked at manure applications? Yeah, so when I was in my presentation today, I was talking about 13 years post manure application, but that was last year. This will be your, thir your 14 this year, but that's just, that's just, um, the, we, when we put the manure on, it wasn't meant to be looked at over the long term. Yeah. It was meant to be like a short term study, like most of our research is over four or five years, right? But so that happened before I, slightly before when I got to my current job, the, the manure was being applied. And then about five years later, I took a break and I said, well, I said, well, what's happened with those plots, you know? So we decided to go back and look at them again. And that started this whole idea of, boy, wait a second. This manure is still affecting crop yields. It's still affecting how much nitrogen is available in the soil. We're still seeing a positive benefit from this manure when we, we shouldn't be based upon the recommendations, right? So what's going on here? So that led to us continue to look at it. So we'll continue to look at these same plots well into the future. And, and now Idaho, just like Southern Alberta here, we do have some similarities, lots of sugar mm -hmm. beet production. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you see the uptake with manure on sugar beets? Well, we have some data with sugar beets grown on manure, right? And um, and uh, in, a, in a study of one of my colleagues, are finding that with really high manure rates, you can see some some quality issues. But even though the quality decreases a little bit with high manure application rates, the yields are shot way up. The sugar beets love manure, and they they get really high yields. But even when you take into account that lower quality with the increased sugar content, that even with high manure, the amount of money the producer is getting back is still higher than when there's no manure being applied. So, but that's a very complex system because when you have high impurities in your sugar beets, it causes problems in the factory and they don't want that. Um, and so there's kind of, there's this kind of like a, it's a very more and more complex and just um, you put this on, you get this certain yield yeah. and you get paid for that. So there's positive effects and some negatives that have to be looked at as well with high manure applications on sugar beets. Okay, absolutely. Anything else you'd like to add about your research? Well, I, I guess my, one of my main messages today was is that we have found, at least in Southern Idaho, that research data is really important and it's not just the re it's not, and also if you're a researcher or if you're a grower or don't look at you know the research in the last say the last four or five years but make sure that every piece of research we're doing is a part of a, pu a piece to a puzzle and so all the past research you've done if everything is analyzed as a whole we can make much more advancements than we can by being too narrowly focused on the most current research yeah absolutely great message okay thank you very much thank for your you time. thank you